Welcome to The Paper Fold. I am your host, Sarah. Before I get to my guest today, I just wanted to remind you all that the Noted at Noted product awards are open. Get those submissions in by April 18th. For more information, head on over to thepapernerd.com. I have a dedicated post on it, as well as a button running along the right side that you can click to get started. Well, my guest today works with two things most creatives are supposed to avoid working with, animals and children, but she makes it look easy to capture their characters, which any parent or pet owner will tell you is typically not the case. Sarah Sloboda is a Cleveland native like me, and with 25 years experience in photography and film, she describes herself as a lifestyle photographer for people ages zero and up. Her work has been nationally published numerous times, most recently in National Geographic's This Book is Cute. I personally crossed paths with Sarah in a really interesting way. I first saw her name when I was photo editing an article on a Martha Stewart wedding event for Stationary Trends several years back. The images in question that I was making sure I was properly crediting were from a really cool event. Couples could book a fun wedding at a paper-themed pop-up chapel in Brooklyn, New York. And Sarah was one of the photographers uh, photographing one of the couples there by their request. Fast forward a couple of years, my daughter was probably five or six when I received an email from a local toy store uh, doing mini shoots with her. I thought her name sounded familiar, so I gave it a goog. And as soon as I realized who she was, I signed up immediately. At the time, a lot of her clients were in New York or San Francisco. So I just felt really lucky as a Clevelander to have someone of her caliber uh, documenting my family. I still remember pulling my daughter Veronica out of her day camp. She was not happy as she did not want to have her picture taken that day. Uh, but Sarah pulled the most amazing results from her. Over the years, Sarah has taken some of my all-time favorite photos of my daughter V and our dog Scout. She's also become a personal friend. And when COVID hit, Sarah moved back to Cleveland from San Francisco. So I got to see her in person last summer when she did my most recent headshot at a local cafe. And as I am prepping this episode, she is still photographing families and finding COVID-friendly ways to do so, as she'll tell you shortly. In 2020, she founded the Heirloom General Store, where she offers products and services to help families cherish their own image archives. Sarah interests me as a guest on several levels. First, just documenting your family. Secondly, documenting them in these crazy times. And third, sharing this powerful imagery through photo cards with distance loved ones. So you can imagine, I have a million questions for Sarah right after this. Hey, paper peeps. So by now, many of my listeners are familiar with the force of stationary nature, better known as Girl with Knife. But if you aren't, time to change all that. From the first moment I spied her booth at her New York Now trade show debut in 2019, I was smitten with this cutting edge range that the world was calling out for. We all just didn't know it yet. Everything is nimbly collage to life, slice by careful slice by the talented and exquisite Alicia Castaldi. This stylish collection of cards, journals, and notepads that have sprung to life under this fashionista's exacting knife is sharp, snarky, sleek, and occasionally very sweet, just like that BFF who would love to hear from you right now. For that reason, whenever I get my hands on Girl With Knife merchandise, I hoard it and use it most sparingly. Alicia recently launched Gift Wrap, and if you're already a fan of her range, you're familiar with her patterns and quality, but 
but these super thick sheets elevate any gift from off the rack to atelier. Her recent releases of Midnight Botanical, Rare Creatures, and Chasing Dreams bring the total styles that slay up to 10. And if you're like me and that you fall in love with a range and want to reside in that world, you're in luck. Alicia recently unveiled Knife House, which was one of the few good things I can think of that came out of 2020. That was when Alicia shifted her operation from LA to this newly renovated concept home in Palm Springs. This completely private, walled and gated estate features panoramic mountain views and countless looks surprises. Take a tour through its magnificent blush pink doors at www.knifehousepalmsprings.com or find it on Instagram at knifehousepalmsprings. Good luck getting your jaw off the floor as you take in this perfect California adult playground. These glamorous digs are available for photo shoots, film projects, special events, and short-term rentals. But just as importantly, all that exquisite Palm Springs flora and fauna have inspired Alicia's soon-to-be-released journal and notepads. She tells me that they're also expanding into home decor, which I, for one, absolutely can't wait to see. So now that you've glimpsed this wonderful world, you need this cutting edge lifestyle brand in your life. Find Girl with Knife in hundreds of shops across the US and half over half a dozen countries. Alicia and Girl with Knife have also been featured in New York Magazine, LA Business Journal, BuzzFeed, and of course, Stationary Trends. I run her work there countless times. Alicia was one of our 10 designers to watch in 2020 and proceeded to live up to that designation when last May, two out of her three nominated cards took CHOP honors at the Noted and Noted Virtual Greeting Card Competition. Then, for our winter 2021 issue of Stationary Trends, Alicia designed the 10 designers to watch frontispiece for us. It is something else if you haven't seen it yet. Also, as of 2021, Alicia is represented by none other than the Daniel Richard showrooms in Atlanta and Dallas. Dan's eye is renowned in this biz, so his representing Girl with Knife is unsurprising, but it also means that this brand needs to be on your design radar stat. Check out this beguiling range at the recently refreshed girlwithknife.com. Right now, the theme is Season of Fierce, and I think we can all use one of those about now. I guarantee your stationery will slay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Paper Fold. I have Sarah here. Welcome, Sarah. Hello. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, my gosh. It is so nice to have you here, and it's nice to see you again. So while you have... Uh, put down more permanent roots down in Cleveland more recently, and you're a native like me, uh, pre pre COVID you, you traveled a lot, uh, photographing clients in different cities. Um, you were a rock and roll photographer. It was such an amazing lifestyle. I loved watching you online, like where you were going and who you were shooting. Now, uh, you're still working, but Obviously, your life and work style has been impacted dramatically. Can you describe how it's changed, um, how you do what you do? Um, yeah. So um, before the pandemic, um, I had this, it was sort of like uh, an unintentional spin on my brand where I was in different cities all the time. So i pretty much every year went to New York and LA, but um, then I had a whole bunch of other cities that sort of rotated like Cleveland, Chicago. I was always in San Francisco. Um, and so I had clients in different places and I had the opportunity to use whatever backdrops were in those places. I could use the different weather patterns of those places. Obviously like California was always lovely. <laughs> um, and some places had more extreme weather. So it was, you know, like just a cool, like constant challenge of, using the backdrop to be compelling and a shot for people's family photos. Um, and so now um, I'm in Cleveland all the time. Um, so that kind of went out of the equation and I wanted to still create a lot of visual interest for people. So I've been mainly focusing on storytelling um, 
my background is in film. So I, storytelling is very important to me. Um, and it was sort of like, it used to be telling stories of these families with different backdrops. And now it's more like much more personal where, um, I, it's like, it, it's, it's more about the passage of time than it is about a relationship of the family to some space. Wow. So I want to try to capture some particular moment in time for them or, um, create a little bit of a story with like a beginning, middle and end that takes place over time. Like you go on a little journey with them. So that's sort of how it's shifted for me. It sort of made me go like, what's, um, what's something you can do from one place? Right, right. Well, that's question. lovely. I mean, like, I love that concept. I have been, it's so funny because from my end, uh, from my domain where I'm talking more about retail and, you know, brands promoting yourself, like it's all about storytelling. Like we're yeah. all, we're all like these captives looking at our screens at waiting to be dazzled. And so the fact that you're, you know, making that um, decision and, you know, choosing to document you know, this moment in time, like to really totally switch up your approach is fascinating. Uh, <laughs> well, and I mean, it was sort of like, um, like as an artist, I don't like to feel reined in. And obviously being locked down was a pretty big <laughs> reining in. <laughs> so I, for my mental health, I had to, instead of feeling like something was keeping me down, I just had to go brought like I just had to expand my horizon and not push against those limits because I think I just would have found that frustrating like I there was nothing in me that wanted to go risk anybody's health or what like there was nothing in me that wanted to push against the lockdown I was like okay we've got a lockdown um so I just thought okay well how do I work right. within this right and right. um it just made me realize like there's so much richness in in going deeper like you don't have to always have a big, huge new horizon. You can go deeper into anybody's story or any spot. Um, like mean, that's why I can't remember if I told you about my little um, garden project. Can I go on that? Tandem? Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I would love to hear about it. Okay. <laughs> um, so when I first, um, uh, it hit me that it wasn't going to be like a two week lockdown, that there was going to be a long period of time where I needed to do something different with my work. Um, I had, I had started gardening in my backyard for the first time. Um, and I thought, well, I'll just get seeds. Cause that seems like where flowers come from, which planting growing from seed turned out to be really challenging. <laughs> and I realized there was a lot more to gardening than, um, I had anticipated. Um, and I kill everything that I've ever <laughs> attempted. Well, then you get something off the ground and the squirrels come and it's like, oh. Um, so what? So I started connecting with other gardeners on Instagram who were in similar zones who could say like, oh, this is the soil we got from this local place and whatever. Um, and I realized like that was a story I wanted to tell and it was local. Mm -hmm. So I started... Um, just asking, I would meet a gardener and I would ask them if they have other friends who garden. And I just sort of like um, followed this thread of like who gardens in Cleveland. And um, uh, I decided it would be a cool thing because the conversations were always so positive. It was like this total escape from, from everything else that was going on in the world. It became about like the, how you, how peaceful people felt and how like in touch with the seasons and in touch with nature. And, uh, so I, that's the story I really wanted to start telling. Right. So, um, look, I mean, when the world is like, everything is going to, you know, hell, like this is a really good time to like, take some time to yourself, connect with nature, watch something grow. Or if you're me, like, make it grow and you know like it's uh turning inward that can sort of you know energize you to deal with all the other stuff yeah totally and so I wanted to try to depict that um and for some reason I was compelled to shoot it on film and Kodak was amazing and donated a bunch of film to this project wow. so yeah so they sent me a big pile of film and I started going around Cleveland and photographing these gardens. And it was important to me. Like I, I asked people, um, whoever I connected with, I asked them if they could in include their spouse or, um, their children or, you know, somebody significant in their life, because, um, 
there was something about the like just the you could just see on their faces as they engaged in this space. It was so different from like two people sitting in a cafe or two people sitting on their couch or whatever. Like it was, they were so enlivened by it. And I just thought like, this is um, the kind of visual story that I, I couldn't do when I was on the road, like just in New York for a weekend, it was like, okay, cool. We got to get the buildings. We got to get like whatever backdrop they want, boom, move on to the next shoot. And so this was such a different thing, but um I don't know. It just, it really helped me embrace the, the story in a deeper way. Like it was like less quick one hour story and more what's the deeper story here? Like what's going on with people? Like what's in people's hearts that's like starting to come out right now. Right. Um, right. And I realized that's with family, you know, I photograph families mostly. And I realized with families that's constant. Like there's, you watch a child grow and they're, they're constantly like evolving into a new phase in some aspect of their life. So there's, you know, like there's so much of that, like with families that you could just capture in their home or in their yard. It doesn't, you, you know, I don't have to be all over the place to do right, that. Right, right. Um, so yeah, it just sort of felt like I went deeper than, yeah, uh, yeah. than I was usually going, which was a good thing. Absolutely. And look in the before times, it's like, a big, not a big deal, but it's an event, you know, when we're like, you're like, okay, we're, we got the session with Sarah, we're taking our holiday picture, like everybody behave, everybody, you know, <laughs> this is what you're wearing, this is what we're doing. And it was like this sort of, you know, it was this, you know, almost like a ritual, like a before times ritual, whereas now it's like, um, it's almost like, well, you're approaching COVID as a creative challenge and you're taking its limitations, you know, is a way to, you know, look deeper, look at something, look at it a different way. And, you know, the, I'm sure the stories you're telling, not that your your photographs have always been amazing and very oh, riveting, um, but I'm sure like the moments that you're capturing and the stories that you're telling in the garden project versus, you know, shooting a family in Golden Gate Park, you know, it's two very different things. Well, it's interesting because they're both like, it makes you realize like how epic every day can look, you know, like you think you need the Golden Gate Bridge or whatever, like to make a stunning photograph, but really like authentic expression and really feeling in touch with nature or feeling in touch with something, your, your family, whatever it is, like when people just really get into a beautiful place in themselves, um, like there's like an epic feeling in that. And it, so it was just really fun to see like that the photos didn't kind of, it, it wasn't like it took them down into this sort of more subtle, mellow place. They were like just as interesting. It was just that, um, you know, the, what the, the story was, what was compelling, right. you know, instead of like you said, like, let's all hustle down to the location and then put a smile on your face right now. You, know? <laughs> you better behave. <laughs> yeah. You better smile or else. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how many people's schedules I had to move around to get this to work? So, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I just, I, I never really, yell at people to smile, by the way. You that was do not. No, it's the mom. It's the mom. <laughs> it's the mom. It's the bad cop. Um, uh, it's okay. I, I, I've embraced being the bad cop and it's, <laughs> it's something that, you know, has, uh, you know, I've grown into. Hey, Paper Peeps. So Kitty Meow Boutique has been a fabulous client of mine for a while now. So hopefully many of my listeners are familiar with not just the dazzling wares from this Chicagoland house of paper, but also its amazing founder, a force of nature better known as Catherine Hildner. This mom of two with another scheduled to arrive soon has created a most intoxicating stationary range. I define the Kitty Meow aesthetic as polished and very smart. Think of the sharpest outfit you own that you feel like a million bucks in, but 
in stationary form. Everything from typography to envelope choice comes together to pack a most enticing punch. But this range is not just about the surface. It's about honoring those connections with those we care about most. And you'll see once you visit kittymeowboutique.com that the wares are divided into witty and sweet because, as Catherine puts it, sometimes you feel a little saucy and sometimes you don't. But Kitty Meow Boutique is so much more than just another pretty face in the marketplace. The empowering messaging found on her cards, invitations, journals, coasters, art prints, and enamel pins elevates the range into something that makes you feel not just seen, but good about yourself too. Everything is essentially a little lift visually and emotionally for not just those you love, but you as well. Not only is Kitty Meow available for your personal shopping needs, it's also available wholesale to all those shops looking for something new with which to excite their customers. She's on FAIR. Visit kittymeowboutique.fair.com and get your shop started. Finally, I think what I love about Catherine most is that she is really all about living your best life, as you'll see for yourself beneath the education tab on her site. She offers KMB Signature Collective, a mastermind for women in the product-based business world who have a love for paper and giftable items, who have an idea and a plan, but need guidance and support to be successful in their efforts. I so agree with Catherine. It's so important to be surrounded by like-minded women and leaders who are willing to put in the work to lift each other up. For that reason, it's not a course. It's a friggin' transformation, people. And Catherine has also started my second favorite podcast, Dreams to Plant, with another brilliant force of nature, my girlfriend Renee, to elevate your daydreams to actual tangible plants. Oh, and if you're on Clubhouse, follow Kitty Meow so you can tune in to her weekly room Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's called Small Business Savvy, Insider Secrets You Need to Know. I checked it out for myself last week, and it was just the dose of inspiration and confidence my day needed. So get those good vibes going at kittymeowboutique.com and tell them Sarah sent you. You know, as professionals, you know, we've always, you know, you develop a certain way of doing something as a creative. And when everything gets upended, you find yourself, um, you know, having to take a new approach and having to push yourself and having to look at things differently, which is beautiful. So and I, I love it. Like, I feel like it's incredibly inspiring to see, you know, all these uh, makers and creators and creatives, um, you know, having to sort of, uh, they have all this great fodder to create new work, but they're having to like totally redefine what they do. And it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, in some ways it's like an artist's dream to suddenly be presented with like, okay, you can't do it that way. You know? right, right. Um, it's a creative ways, challenge. Yeah. In some ways it's, it's like what we want out of our, you know, creative life. But um, I think I can say like most people were not that wasn't their first reaction. <laughs> no, 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 no. Most people were like, no, this is terrible. This, this no, is no, not no. what I was planning on right no, now. No, 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 no. I mean, if there's 10 stages of grief, like, yeah. then, you know, like, you know, you're not getting to the point where you're like finding a creative path until like eight, you know, or nine. <laughs> like, and you've already like emotionally been through the ringer. Right. But, but that sort of brings me to, I wanted to talk to you about, I, about your candle shoots. I love the concept. I think they're amazing. And I feel like you kind of came up with this idea out of this. So can you please tell me a little bit about them? Yeah. So, um, so it's interesting. I first came up with the idea that I wanted to shoot by candlelight out of necessity. I was doing one of my short stint trips like I, I had two maybe three days in LA and a client that I see every year um 
couldn't get their work schedule to coordinate with when it was daylight. <laughs> like it was like, it was like the end of November. So, it, you know, got dark at 4.30 or something. Like it was, the sun went down at 4.30. So um, I, I, they wanted to do the shoot and I was trying to come up with like, how could we make it look beautiful? But what if, what if it's dark? <laughs> so um, uh, I, we, so I pitched that to them and they were not against it, but then they had a friend who had this like epic rooftop available. So they were like, well, if we go there, like as the sun is setting, like, can we get some cool, you know, cityscape sunset view? So, I, so that's what I shot. So I ended up not doing the candlelit shoot with them, but I was sad that I didn't get to do the candlelit God. shoot with them. Because by like, that point, you're like really starting to like the idea and getting excited yeah, about it. I was idea. like, this is like yeah. a cool, like it, you know, made me stretch out of like I usually, I you know, preferred to shoot natural light. I I pretty much always photograph kids outside. I mean, it's been slightly different with the pandemic. I'm occasionally, you know, with these pink candlelight shoots, I'm shooting from the porch, so the family's inside and I'm mm -hmm. outside. Um, but I think that gives the kids a little dynamic because like someone's out the window. I just find kids are usually better outside. Like they're, they just, they just respond better outside. So um, in that regard, like I couldn't just put them in a studio with lights, like a photographer with a studio could shoot any time of day. But right, right. Um, for me, I was, I'm like, it's important to me to have, let the kids roam around and have fun. So um, yeah. So I put that in my back pocket and I was like, all right, someday I want to shoot by candlelight. And then uh, in 2020, it was like, everyone like home just took on a completely different meaning. And I started thinking about what feels like home that's visual. And of course, like, you know, 5,000 Amazon boxes is in the corner is like part of being home all the time, you know, like just, just that, but that's not very photogenic. So I was <laughs> like, I was like, what's something, you know, that feels homey. And I, and the candlelight thing came back to me, like, um, conjures the sense of like gathering around the fireplace and like, you know, so many people started doing puzzles and things this year. So it was like, uh, you know, gathering around the table, um, enjoying your takeout and, you know, parents having a glass of wine and, um, and, and, and it, it felt like it brought out the sweetness of that experience right. instead of it being like, ah, we're stuck home. You know, <laughs> it's like the thing that we'll probably miss about this in five years, you know, was that like just, you know, those quiet moments when we were kind of bored and stuck together. Um, so I thought like, you know, now's the candlelight, you know, like there was a reason I had this idea and it sort of suddenly had some some relevance. Right, right. No, I mean, it's beautiful. It changes the light. It makes it, you know, I don't know, it, it suffuses it with meaning. And, but I think, I think what I really love about it, I don't, and I'm not quite sure why. Well, I sort of know why. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> the fact that you're doing it out the window is that like you're glimpsing in, you're yeah. like seeing this, pe these people's world and you're, you're instead of in front of the Golden Gate Bridge or Golden Gate Park or whatever, it's like, no, 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 they're in their home and you're seeing <laughs> what they've been doing for the last year. Obviously, you know, the child's hair is brushed. Everyone looks a little, you know, more polished. <laughs> you always mom, look like that. What are you saying? Oh, mom <laughs> took off her sweatpants and brushed her hair. You know, like it's, but you know, it's, there's something beautiful. There's something very beautiful about glimpsing into the world and capturing that. It is, it is telling a story, yeah. um, but it's, I don't know. I, the, to me, like as soon as I saw it on your Instagram, feed I was like wow and, you know and then my next oh. thought was I have to get wine for my family well, that's really well said I think um you know, as a photographer I I worry about sounding voyeuristic so it's not <laughs> I wouldn't be like hey I'm peeking in your window you know like it's not how I would frame it right, but you right. said it so beautifully it's like in a way it's like framing a story like it's literally using the window to frame the family story and so the visual sort of reinforces that idea a little bit like let's tell our story right right and it's it's very i don't know there's something very there's very it's very timeless it's very uh beautiful the obviously the candlelight gives it a sort of like a vermeer yeah, the light's really flattering 
Yeah, it's like really everyone flattering. Looks like everyone should be photographed in candlelight. They'll never <laughs> want another portrait again. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's really it's like, flattering. It's, it's like, like oh, you look amazing. Like your skin's all glowy, and you can't see any flaws. It's just right, it's right. a good situation. And uh, and the quality has a sort of a timelessness to it as well. I think it's very like Vermeer. I, to me, I mean, that's what I see. It's very, I don't know. I, I really like it. And um, oh, I think I, I was really excited when I saw it and I love the idea of, you know, taking, taking a challenge and turning it into something really cool that, you know, you might not have ever thought of. Otherwise. Well, and it's cool too because I had thought of it before, but it wasn't like the right time. Right, right. You know, right, I feel right. like that's the other cool thing with the pandemic is like there's stuff that we didn't have time for or it wasn't a priority. And now there, there's like a window where it's like, oh, maybe this, you know, thing that I've had, you know, lingering for a while, maybe there's a fit now. And I think that's a cool thing for, for artists to try too. Yeah. Totally, totally. So I wanted to shift gears and talk a little bit about uh, photo editing and picking images and that sort of stuff. You obviously see so much uh, in terms of like, you know, you've looked at so many photos, you can tell a good one, you can tell a bad one, you can tell like where the crop needs to be like, you, you know, <laughs> you can sort of develop an eye, you know, over time, you know, the majority or not a lot, I'm not going to a lot of listeners, you know, they're taking their family, their family photos themselves, right? Uh, more likely than not with their iPhones, or, you know, not, you know, they don't, they don't have what you're decked out with when you took my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so once you get to the point where you are reviewing images, I'm mm -hmm. curious to know how do, what are the criteria that you use to pick the best one? Like how do you differentiate between like a good shot and a great shot and yeah. a great shot and like, that's the shot. So, I'll tell you that and then we'll probably have to work backwards because okay, that's fine. usually you kind of have to narrow it down. But the first thing, but so the, the main thing, the deciding factor um, is always emotional. Okay. So I had a mentor when I first started, he said, edit for emotion. But people think of editing now as like what you do in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And what he meant was more culling, like what yeah. a photo editor does for a magazine, like selecting and placing and, you know, figuring out the order and that kind of thing. So um, so he would say edit for emotion. And so for me, like my my style, like what I um, like, what I feel like I'm about as an artist is a more. Uh, is a very like optimistic and more positive take oh, on life. Absolutely. You absolutely are like very jubilant. Your work is very upbeat and jubilant and sweet Aww. and, you know, Thank like you. all about, fa all about family and, you know, the connections with people we love, which should be upbeat. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they're not always. And that's no, why I think it's, no. that's what the, where I think the value is in amplifying that for ourselves. Like that, that for me, like if I'm taking a photo, I want to remember the positives because they're sometimes not the easy things to remember. Right, right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm looking for emotions that are, are, that feel expansive or joyful. Um, uh, like, you know, I work with kids who they can be rambunctious, but that's not the vibe. Like, that's not what I'm looking for. So even when, so I do that a little bit as I'm shooting, like I'm sort of engaging with people in a certain way, looking for a certain thing. Um, but when I go to edit, like, it's very clear to me, like which ones, oh, that was a really joy. That's when the dad made the joke and everybody laughed and right. it was a, they were really laughing and you can tell, you can see on their faces, the joy right. coming out right. of that moment. Right. Right. Um, so that's the most important thing. And I, you know, I think what's, uh, when I was thinking about our talk today, I was thinking like how to remember that you know, like, cause you go through your phone and sometimes you snap so many so fast and they're, and you start, you're flipping through, you're flipping through and they kind of look identical. Um, and so the way I thought of remembering, it was like, there's no emotion filter. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. There's so, no, that's, and they cannot invent it. You can't. Yeah. So you can always, you can always enhance the photo. You can always add some vibrance or adjust the color or, 
you know, if there's something strong about the composition, but the light was just bad, you can always make it black and white. Like there's always things you can do to the photo, but you can't slap emotion on it. Like there's, like, right, there's, there's no, no emotion, emotion filter. filter, no matter what you cannot. So yeah. yeah so, so you, so you choose for emotion, you find the emotion that you like. And I think parents are especially well equipped to do this. When I do it, I'm, I'm focusing on, you know, I present this brand, like you said, that's very joyful. And so my clients are expecting that. So I have to edit accordingly. Right, right. Um, but with parents, I think they have this cool opportunity because every person is different. Every child is different. So a parent knows what's authentic for right. their child. Right. They know right. what that's not their real smile or that, oh, that's not a smile, but they make that face all the time. I like know, which is so, so funny because you're making me think of like with my daughter, my my husband and I, she has some express, like she has one expression that we just call the face. And, like, <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's a face she makes when she eat when we usually when we get her to try something and she doesn't like it. And like, it's just the face, it's just the face. And like, like, if I could get that in a photo, like that we could always look at and laugh at, like, that's amazing. And, you know, within families, you have these like inner jokes and little stories and you're right. Like, that's what I, that's what I want to capture. Like, yeah, I want yeah. my kid, I want my kids to look good. I, you know, I want everyone to be looking at the camera, but it's more about like, you know, capturing these, you know, like, you know, these moods and, and, you know, connections. I think parents who like, photos take lots of them so it's like just keep on doing that but when you're going to decide like which one would be a cool photo on a card or um if you want to make an album or if you want to you know do the old-fashioned thing and have prints out on your wall like people used to do when I was growing up um <laughs> like they didn't, the they didn't only just move, like you know stare at their phone all the time um if you so I mean just thinking about wanting to you, like take something out and amplify amplify the emotion of it in your life, like cherish it in some way. Um, yeah, like I, you know, I think parents have this cool opportunity to like go, oh, what's oh, this one's so that you know, and you can look through and you'll know, like there's just a hint of it, or um, oh, she used to do that when she was a baby, or you know, and um, like those are the ones I would pull out as a parent and just like put them, favorite them, put them in a special spot, and then when you're ready to do something, like those are. Those are the totally, magic ones. Totally. And it has nothing to do with like the light or what. I mean, of course, if the light's nice right. and the background's cool, that's like <laughs> a great bonus. Like, that's amazing. But I think um, I I wouldn't look for that. Like, I, you like look for the emotion and then everything Go else. Go from there. Yeah. Out from there. yeah. And eventually, like what happens is you start, like it forces you to become more conscious when you're photographing of like, well, oh, wait, this background's not that good. And you kind of adjust yourself. And so then if the kid makes a cool face, you also have a cool backdrop. Right, but it's like, right. but it's sort of like you have to first see the emotion and like understand what led to it and understand like, oh, that's because we were playing and they weren't even paying attention to me. And I just snapped <laughs> that or whatever, you know, right, however right. you got it. Right. So instead of looking for, you know, the shot, the layout, the, you know, the moment, oh, you know, look at mommy, you know, that type of thing. Uh, it's more just about, you know, um, learning how to find the moment and then working outward. Yeah. And it's tricky with iPhone because, um, it doesn't capture movement, especially well, especially when you're in low light. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that, like one thing I would do is probably like engage the, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to take a photo, you know, pose for the photo. And they've heard this like so much, like, I would engage oh some God. sort of game. I, like if you can yeah. figure out a game that they'd be willing to play is different, like for every age, but like some, like, you know, it, honestly, teenagers are great. Like just be like, okay, let me know when your outfit's good and we'll do a photo shoot and like, like build off of their interests. I think that's the main thing is if like the way to get a kid to get a photo that you like is to let them art direct it. Right, <laughs> like, right, right. like what well, are I you want to photograph? Cause kids will eventually like so many moms, so especially blogger moms who are like constantly taking pictures of their kids will like come to me and be like, Oh, you can't even believe like the kid came in had the outfit on was like mom can you take my picture I'm gonna hold this thing like they get into it so you can't you know like it, 
I think if you can somehow engage their interests and let them say what, how they want the photograph, it's you have a much better chance of like just trying to grab them while they run across the room on an iPhone. Absolutely. Well, with, and with once they get to a certain age with, well, with, when my, I feel like when my daughter was like maybe eight or nine, I started noticing when other moms would be like, Hey, come on, let's take a picture. And the, the, you know, kids put on a face. They have like their photo they, face. They put the photo face on and that's yeah. what you don't want. So, right. uh, because it's not really them, like you're not catching, capturing their essence. And so by the time they get to be teenagers, like, like my daughter, like she's 14 and she's in high adolescence or, well, I, we actually asked me that in a year. I might have a different answer, but you know, <laughs> like she, the only way I'm going to get a good photo is if I'm going to let her call most of the shots yes. I, because she's got to be comfortable. Otherwise it's just, it's just going to be a horrible experience for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, and, totally. and I'm not going to have anything to show for it. And I'm not even going to get that photo. So, you know, right. you have to work with your, work with your client. I mean, your child. <laughs> 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 work with the talent. Um, <laughs> so I that's, think that's spot on. Yeah. I mean, and I think that goes for any age. I think when they're younger and still needing more guidance from their parents, they seem more malleable, <laughs> but they're really not like, they'd still be thrilled if you like let them choose, you right, know, like right. they, they, they always like to choose. So I think any way you can set it up for the kid to have a choice in something and then just have fun with them and, you know, like, don't, don't worry about the backdrop. You're looking for the emotion, you know, and then, you're, and then that's, that's what you're going to want. I mean, you know, in 20 years, that's, those are the faces you're going to want on. Right. On in 20 years, you're not going to care that like you were at a petting zoo and the dot, the horse in the background's head was, you know, not at a great angle. Like, in fact, in 20 years, you're probably going to think that's hilarious. Like, <laughs> you're gonna be like, look at that horse. What's that horse doing? You know, I know, I know. I remember how mad I was about the horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a drive us crazy now <laughs> you look at them like oh why oh that stupid thing is in the background like th that's part of the story I mean all of my photos my childhood photos from the 80s like they're very <laughs> poorly composed and it's like oh oh I remember that toy that's like sitting on the floor behind me you know like it's something weird that it's like wow I'm glad that's in the picture so right right, right. I mean often it uh, sometimes you know with time like that can be the most important thing in the picture and you didn't even know it um, exactly. you know so exactly who knows so yeah. that being said um I know you do offer remote services for photo editing what what do you do uh for clients who have captured that photo with their iPhone that they want, um, but it's not like quite there. Um, yeah. So I have a couple packages actually. So one is if, if what I just described of mm. going through hundreds of photos and teasing out the emotions, it seems an overwhelmingly daunting task because some people have thousands of photos on their phone. Um, they can just send me all of them and I'll do the calling. Wow. Nice. Yeah. So I, and you know, maybe all of them, you know, sometimes people don't want to, you know, me to see everything on their phone. So maybe they do a narrow edit, like they pull all the ones from that vacation or all the ones from last year with the kids in them or something like that, where it's, they kind of do a loose edit, but it's not as time consuming as like choosing the one right. from right. every series or whatever. Wow. Oh, that's wonderful. Because I mean, like, you know, the moms who take photos every in it minute and then yeah. like are like oh I just have got home from vacation and I have 10,000 photos and I don't know what to do with them and you right. know so especially people with a newborn baby I mean it's like they take photos every hour <laughs> um so yeah and it, and it's like it I understand that like wanting to like, because yeah, little yeah, babies yeah. change so much. So it's yes, like, yes, you know, and then you have all these photos and you're, and you're looking at the baby a year later going, I don't want to get rid of any of these photos. You know, it's like, I think that's the problem people have. They think of it as like getting rid of them. Like I don't delete anything. Like I keep everything. So don't worry. Like <laughs> they're not going anywhere. I'm just trying to help you choose ones that have some really beautiful emotional resonance that, uh, you can, you can do something more special with, right. um, like all the, all the thing, all the photos that I remember from my childhood, like from my family and my siblings and I growing up are the ones we had out on the wall. 
and like, you know, you get a roll of film back, back in the day. Um, and you, there's 30 shots on there, but one of them got blown up as an eight by 10. And right. that's the one we remember. That's the one we engage with. So I think, um, yeah, like it's too overwhelming. Like you're not engaging with 5,000 photos. You, you right. need to pick a couple. Right. Right. <laughs> and it's those. Like, it's like giving a child too many choices. Yeah. You know? Like you never get anywhere. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's and just, I think it's, it's important for kids. Like for, for me, like that was part of my identity where it's like being able to look at these photos and be like, oh yeah, that was when I was five and my siblings were these ages. And like, it just creates a sense of place in your life to have, a few moments like sort of set aside and relish. Right, right. And it's and it is. It's your identity and it's how you remember things. Isn't it funny too? Like sometimes you remember things a certain you remember an old photo a certain way and then yeah. you see it like your aunts or uncles and you're like, wait a minute, that was not how I remembered it at all. Like, totally. like your memory plays tricks on you because you even you've idealized that representation. Right. Or there's something about it that your like child mind latched onto that was more playful than the situation actually was. Or it's, it's like, um, yeah, the, right. the interpretation over time is really interesting. And I, I just feel like, um, you know, I mean, I've taken probably millions of photos and I, but I, I don't, engage with them all that way. Like I, you know, I tease some out. I focus on where my work is going. I focus on, you know, each family that I'm working with or each business that I'm working with and like, what's the story that's happening here. And, you know, some end up on Instagram, some end up in my portfolio. And like, those are the, like, that's my story as an artist, like evolving. Um, and it's not that all of that isn't in there. Like I don't, delete photos, <laughs> you know, they're all yeah, there. But you don't, it's just yeah. that there's some that, uh, that you build off of and whether it's for me, like building my craft or a family building their memories. Um, I do think it's important to like highlight, like, where's the moment? Like we're kind of like you, I, I got inspired a lot, um, listening to jazz musicians perform live mm -hmm. because it was like, they could feel something coming. Like you could watch them and you could just tell, like, something was coming and they would all kind of hit at the same time and it would, the music would swell and you'd feel it all of a sudden. And I think photos do that too. And not every photo does it. So you're sort of looking for that, like, Oh, that's, that's us, you know, like, right. That's that photo. Like one of my favorite family photos, I'm not even in it. <laughs> <laughs> I took it. So it's, I'm involved, but it was this snapshot. I had, I think I was probably 12, maybe 13. Uh, maybe a little bit older, but young, you know, okay. um, and I walked into the room and my parents and my brother and sister were like spread out all over the place, like laying on the floor in these crazy positions. And they were trying, they were playing a game with a balloon. I don't know where we even had a balloon from, but they were trying not to let the balloon hit the ground. Oh, that's a great game. I love that game. Don't touch yeah. the ground. Don't touch the ground. So, but they, but I walked in and it was like my parents were laying on their backs with their like arms and legs in the air and my sip because they were doing the like floor guarding yeah. and my siblings were running around the room, like doing the keep it up in the air part of the game. And I, I just was the most hysterical thing to walk. Like I wasn't involved in the game. I just walked in and that's what they were doing. And it was so ridiculous to me. So I just grabbed the camera and no, everyone immediately was like, no, don't take my picture. So <laughs> my dad's like trying to jump up off the floor. My mom doesn't know what's going on. And like, I mean, it was just, it was this ridiculous, it was, it was like a badly lit flash photo on like 110 film. You know, it's just the, no, nothing quality wise at all, but it, it's like my, me and my siblings favorite photo. Like that's the photo. Like that's our family, you know, like just uh, like wackiness. Awesome. And then I come in and capture it, you know, it was like, it, so it told my story too, you know, like that I was the one taking the photo. So. Right. Right. And it tells something about like everybody's role in the family. And exactly. That exactly. I love that. No, I have a couple <laughs> pictures of family members doing that. And those are my favorites too. Yeah. <laughs> don't take the picture shots. <laughs> it's like what family's about, right? Like right, messing with right, each other right, a little bit. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Who else can you do that too? So, yeah. so, you know, so the first remote service that you and that you offer is just the 
give me all your photos and I'll pick that one out. And right. Or any, uh, you know, or any kind of select, like a, like I have a vacation friend. package where it's like, yes. send me, you know, you went to the Yosemite, send me all your Yosemite shots and I'll help you, you know, create a little story out of that. And those, the packages that I do with, um, uh, where it's like a year, like baby's first year or, um, a vacation one, um, come with an album. So I edit it down, um, do all the color correction. I think that's what you were getting to next. Like what comes next? Right, right. Like um, what other technical stuff that I don't understand? That you do? <laughs> so interestingly, what I do with the photos that my like I've then called, or if my clients want to do their own selection and just say, "We, you know, I have twenty photos I want to send to you." Um, make, them, make them look. Make them look. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So I take them into Photoshop and Lightroom exactly in the same workflow as when I edit my own work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I first learned photography in the darkroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what that means is like when you shoot a frame on a negative, it's it it's sort of like a container of potential. Like it you could just turn the enlarger on and see whatever's there. Sure, sure. Um, but sure. most likely you're going to need to add some contrast or tweak. Yeah. The amount. What's that called? Burning and dodging I, and burning. Dodging and burning. Like yeah. I, I learned, I learned, I took a couple of photography classes. I learned the basics and I mean, I loved it. I love that world. Um, so magical. But, I feel like that uh, was just such a cool, it's, I mean, it's like alchemy, you know, I mean, it's literally chemical and, to see a blank sheet, like have an image form on it was just the most thrilling. It's crazy. Magic. The first time you put it in the chemicals and you see it come to life, like the, it is, it, it is something magical. About and you're like, that. I can't believe it's there. It's like invisible ink. Like, <laughs> so cool. <laughs> but, um, but I'm sorry. So go on. So you, uh, so, well, so that was my background. So the, so the, so in essence, what you're doing is you're taking this negative that contains a lot of potential mm -hmm. and there's, there's a bit of a science like we just talked about. There's like, you know, the, the science and it, we are not using chemicals anymore, but there's the science of the light, mm -hmm. um, the exposure, the density, the color balance. There's, there's the science of it, but there's also an artistry to it, which you, you know, you started getting into like dodging, burning, how to emphasize something that wasn't naturally emphasized by the way the photo was taken. Um, and, uh, so the, it's, there's sort of like a, what I mean by potential is I look at the photo and think like, uh, if there's a person in it, first of all, I've, I always want to make their skin tones look how they should in a portrait. Sometimes that means the background's going to get washed out or, um, it just, it, it sometimes it means the background is going to have a weird color cast. And I'm sort of fine with that because um, I want the skin tone to look better. Like I don't care right, about the, the background. Skin, so yeah, the, yeah. The skin, the person in it. And, and honestly, yeah. your client wants, it is going to probably want to look good skin yeah. over the background. Exactly. <laughs> I know I would. <laughs> and there's some, and there's some enhancements you can do to make that match up. It's a little bit more involved, but um but you can work on that. But it's sort of like what I mean by um, I'm trying to put into words what I mean by like uh, interpreting the photo. It's like the, the photo has this innate potential in it. And it sort of will. And now that I've done it for so many years, it feels like it sort of speaks to me about like what the photo wants. Like <laughs> it's it. like there's a, you have like a shorthand that you can kind of look at it and say, OK, you know, I got to work on that. And, uh, you know, maybe the crop might be or whatever right. um, like I a lot look. of times it has to do with color like I, I was fortunate to be able to learn color printing in uh -huh. the dark room too uh -huh. um and I what I so when you're using when you're printing black and white if a photo doesn't really pop like if it if, if it just sort of feels too gray and flat you can add contrast to it and it'll pop Right. Um, but with color, you don't really have, there's like a density dial, but you don't have contrast in the same way. And what I found was that you had to nail the color. Like you had to get the color exactly right. And then the photo would pop. Like it would just, it was like you added contrast. It just like came alive. And I think most of the time, like that's what I'm doing on almost every photo is like finding that color tweak 
that's going to make it come together in that way. Right, and then right, right. with iPhone shots, inevitably, I'm doing also some kind of exposure adjustment because they, it, it just takes a lowest common denominator exposure of, you know, whatever its algorithm tells it to do, mm-hmm. which isn't always, you know, like I said, the perfect portrait light or whatever. Um, so yeah, so often the first thing I do is like, how, like, let's, let me, what's the, uh, uh, I was going to say ground zero is a weird analogy, but okay. like, what's the, <laughs> what's the, like, what's you the know, starting off point? What's like, the real color? Like where do I make the color really hit? Like, and, and that's, you know, the first thing that'll enhance a photo like anytime. Um, and that's tricky to do. I mean, there's a lot of times people uh, get presets or they'll use some filter on Instagram that, if they get lucky, sort of does the equivalent of that. <laughs> but most of the time, it just covers up a flaw with another. Right, flaw. right, right. Most of the time, it backfires because you're not using it correct. You don't know, you know, you don't know. People okay. aren't looking for the enhancement in the same way that I am. They're looking for like, this needs to be brighter, or I don't like my face in this or whatever. And then this f- filter, you know, makes it more pink. And so suddenly it's more flattering and now they like it, but it's not exactly color balanced. Right. So, and I'm not, I'm not against that. I mean, you know, inter- if, if you want, if you don't think you look good in a photo, I think that's really <laughs> fine to play around with it and enjoy, you know, just enjoy playing with the color, you know? Um, but it's different from that. And that I'm like looking at every photo and trying to optimize that photo for its potential instead right. of, um, uh, you know, just instead of putting some blanket enhancement on every single shot. Right. Right. No, I, I get it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sure when they see the results, you know, I gave her 10 photos, I gave her my favorite 10 photos that I took over this year to edit or whatever. Like, I'm sure it's jarring when you hold up the before and afters. I love doing the before and afters. Like I do screenshots of them because it's like, you just literally can't, I mean, they're That's completely amazing. different. That's amazing. That's amazing. I want it now. I want to see some, so I'm going to have to bug you for some <laughs> if, your, if your clients are okay with it. Um, so so once you get to that point where you're like, okay, I have the photo. Now this is going to be on a photo card. Like yeah. to your mind, what are, what are the ingredients? Like once you get to that point, um, what should people be thinking about? So the first part is what I sort of described already. Sure. Um, that, uh, and that was something I did mostly in the fall was when people wanted me to edit photos. It was like, edit my photos and then, you know, produce my cards. Produce your card. And yeah. you, you, you do produce cards as well. Um, if you're like me, you get a lot of cards from other people. And I love when people send them to me, but I, I'm judgy. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> I can't well, help how it. could you I not? Be You're going to be like, like, this paper, what have you done? This is a um, great photo. I'll, you know, and I'll think about it. This is a great photo. I <laughs> love it. It totally captures the emotion. Like, what were they thinking with this paper? Like, yeah, or, yeah. you know, the flimsy. I, I have a real, I hate flimsy paper and I hate shiny paper. I'm like, okay. So, and, but it, and that's a personal thing or, you know, or sometimes like, I don't like it if I think that foiling looks cheap. Like, I think I love foil, yeah. but I feel like foil can go cheap especially yeah. if the paper's too flimsy. And then don't even get me started on envelopes. Like, I, <laughs> like, <laughs> well, so, um, yeah, so I don't have your breadth <laughs> of knowledge of stationery, but I think I share your passion for it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> people, please still send me your photo. I promise I won't judge it. I don't want to. <laughs> no, that's the it. thing too. I th- I'm the same. I I still want the cards. I still love to see what people do. Um, but um, but yeah. So I have I had the same experience as you. Um, and I so I because of my field, I had the opportunity to do some little experimenting with this. So I ordered a card through company for my own Christmas cards. Mm -hmm. And it was a really simple design. It was like, um, it was like half the card had like a red block with white text. And then the other half had a photo. Okay. And when I got the card, it wasn't just, I mean, the card stock was fine. Like it didn't make me go, Oh my God, it's amazing stationery, but, (laughs) but it was fine. Like it didn't bother me. But what bothered me was it wasn't 
it just was flat. Like it was like, I thought this was going to be red and it was like almost pink. And the photo, wow. um, that's the, that's the worst. Yeah. The photo that I chose, like it just, it just didn't have any detail. Like it had, it was super pixelated. Like you could see the dot printing, you know, the CMYK oh, dot that's the worst. printing. And I was like that. Okay. Um, I'm sending this to my friends, but I'm still a photographer and I don't want my photo quality to be questionable. <laughs> so right, right. I, well, it's, it's so a reflection of you on many levels because it's also your profession and right. it's a representation of you. And plus you're a creative. So like everything you do is your baby and yeah, <laughs> I get so, it. The first, so the variable of, you know, it was a professional photograph. So the variable of the photo quality, the, in, the, the file quality of the photo was not in question. So I was like, this is a printing issue. Like I just knew it was a printing issue. So I took the exact same file and I knew that my photo lab, like I work with a professional photo lab that works specifically with photographers. So I took the file, the card file, exact same card. I didn't change anything. And I sent it to my lab to print and it came back like it was like the ink was in the paper and the reds were red and the picture was crisp. And I was like, OK, I can't like in good conscience refer people to um, Vendor retail a. card printers anymore right. <laughs> because right. because I like I can offer this level of quality to my clients. So um so I started offering that specifically. My lab has a an array of uh, designs, some with foil, like you described, um, typical, like like what you see on Minted or whatever else. Um, not quite as many designs, um, but they have a number of them. I mean, you know, basically super minimalist, like there's something for everybody kind of vibe. But the difference is they're a photo lab who is obsessed with you know, color perfection, like I described in the digital editing process, their machines are calibrated with the same precision. So if you're a stationary company and you want to print blue, like you can get in the vicinity and your client's going to be happy. But with photos, it's not true. Like with, with a photo, if you're a tiny bit too blue, the photo isn't going to pop like I was describing right. in the darkroom. Right, right. So that to me was like, okay, this, I, I, you know, I'm not going to tell people not to use another card service if they love one and it's easy for them. But if people want to know where to get the absolutely best one, then I'm going to have them order through me right. and they can get through my, right, get right. them through my lab. Right. Why buy a dress, you know, from Nordstrom and go to Walmart's photo studio to get shot in it? Like photo, if a, card a photo card is not printed well or on good paper it's going to fade after a few years and you i keep all of i keep copies of all the cards i've sent my new year's cards that i've sent out and i want them Aww. to look the same in 10 yeah. years when i look at them so if you use a flimsy paper even if the photo is great or it the, you know it's not it's not going to hold up over time and you know i i like sending out new year's greetings but you know, selfishly, I will admit part of the reason I do them is for myself to have this document of like what we were doing this year. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, I, yeah, I found it was like a, it was like a good, um, exclamation point on the year. I was trying to do them every year, but it's also my busiest time of year. So it was, that was in, in conflict. And this year, you know, I don't know, the pandemic made me feel kind of lazy and like not urgent because no deadlines got met. It seemed like in life. Um, so I didn't do that. I didn't even, I didn't even get photos taken for my cards until the end of January. Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And I, so this year I worked with a designer, um, they called forward press and they, and she created, um, uh, a, an array of car, of just 10 different card designs exclusive for me to use nice, for my clients. Nice, nice. And the cool thing about that was that she gave me the files so I could change the greetings. <laughs> Like, so she had the font and it was right, all like right, placed right, and whatever. Right. So nice. I was like, you know, I'm just going to send winter greetings from Cleveland. That's very nice. That's instead of, because I was like, it's going to be the middle of February before they right, get the cards. Right, so, right. but I still wanted to send them. And honestly, I don't know that I'll go back. I enjoyed not having to feel rushed and just making it, um, 
you know, wanting to connect with people for my own sake, not because it was like this time of year when everybody does it. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, I love that. It's a good segue into my next question. But I, before I before I expand on that, like one thing uh, that I've been hearing in the greeting card industry is that um, so the greeting card industry is kind of slowly changing in that um, one of the things that's affecting it is that I believe it was two years ago, uh, millennials overtook baby boomers in numbers. And so, and the way millennials send greeting cards and communicate with each other is different than baby boomers just because they're different generations. They live different times. So one of the crazy things that is a difference with millennials is millennials don't need necessarily to wait for Valentine's Day to send their friends a card. There are more of the kind, like if I see that card and it speaks to me and it reminds me of like my joke that I have with my friend, I'm going to buy it and send it to her. Like I'm yeah. not waiting. I don't need the world to tell me, you know, it's thinking of you week or whatever to think of the people I love. I'm going to reach out. So, yeah. you know, what you're saying is like, why send out a New Year's card? Why send out a Christmas card? I'm sending out a winter greetings card and that works for me. And that's kind of how I'm doing it. So what do you think are some other good times around the year or like might help people start thinking about when are good times to reach out with, you know, photo cards? Yeah. So I didn't know that statistic or that, um, not statistic, but I didn't know that about millennials that, that, that there's any research on when and why they send cards. I think that's really cool. I know it's a little, it's still a little, you know, arbitrary and, you know, anecdotal, but it's, that seems to be what it's showing. Yeah. I, and I think like, um, so it's interesting because one of the things I was going to to mention to you. So first of all, of course, like I just took the Christmas card tradition and retimed it to my own timing. And I found that to be fine. I thought, I was like, why do I always put this pressure on myself to do this in December? You know, I don't, I I love it. I love it. I mean, I always have sent out New Year's cards, A, because, um, because, well, because we're Jewish and we send out cards to, you know, our family and right. people are not in the faith. And Hanukkah is always at a different time of year. I cannot keep right. up when it is. I will never be ready for Hanukkah in this lifetime. And New Year's, I felt like, I oh, and I always have, uh, winter stationary trends always goes to press at the beginning of December. So my life is always like crazy then. Yeah. And so I always thought, well, I'll send a New Year's card. It gives me a little extra time. People, the pressure's off. You can send them out later. And I love it. And, yeah. and I think wishing people a happy New Year is like, fairly universal like no one's gonna exactly get <laughs> so exactly you don't have to worry about if your greetings pc or not although i also saw a trend recently where people were just gonna they're like i'm just sharing my greeting my cultural greeting with you so if i say merry christmas it's not i'm not you know no i still want your hanukkah card <laughs> it's just that i'm sharing my the way i say it with you and i sort of thought like you know that's kind of cool like it evolved past being pc into just accepting that we all have different right faiths and and it's and each one is like interesting and cool and yeah. different and um look if someone sends me out Ramadan greetings, like I know they're not expecting me to convert. Right, you know, exactly, they're like, exactly. They're just, gonna sh- they're they're just sharing, sharing me a they're little sharing part something, of the world and maybe I'll yeah. learn something. <laughs> I think that's what, like for me, that's what it is. It's like a greeting that's sharing that something that has meaning to me. And I don't know how that will resonate with you, but that's why I'm sending you a card. It's like, this has meaning to me. I wanted to share with you. And then the person can reply. I mean, that's like old school letter writing, right? Right, right. Like You you present an idea and then the person can reply as they ponder it. Um, But yeah, so to get to your question of like other ideas. So I was like, okay, brainstorming ideas. So first (laughs) of all, so birth announcements, I think is a great tradition. I, I don't know how trendy that is at the moment, but I um, love it. I mean, look, if you're going to have a baby, you have to send. I mean, well, it, I mean, obviously I'm a paper person, but like, yeah, that's like, I just think it's a beautiful tradition. Like everybody, like everybody loves hearing about a new baby. Like everybody, it's like just such a, it's just such a hopeful feeling. Like, especially now when it's like, you might not have gotten that shower. You might not have, you know, no one's <laughs> yeah. having sees anymore. Like, you know, if, if your niece has a baby, you might not, see it for a long time so you might get that card and 
Um, I could see the same going for weddings. If, if you look weddings, at this, you I know. Just, yeah, I, it's like graduation engagement. I feel like, um, you know, if you're like traditionally in a non pandemic year, you would have your save the dates and you'd have you know engagement photo on there, but like maybe you're not having a big wedding now. So still send the engagement card. You know, I just think that that's so, those photos I are so cool. It. I mean, like, yeah. and that is very, you know, it's very of our times. It's very like uh, Corona friendly and that like, you know, uh, greeting card usage is up, letter writing is up. Well, so should photo cards because all these events that are getting canceled should have some kind of right. collaboration. Right. Well, yeah. and the other thing, so, so going back to your millennial thing, like, which I didn't know, but the other thing that I wrote down to uh -huh. talk to, was that um people are at, like you could do you, you could make a card of anything really like you could make a photo card of anything and actually people are really good at it now because it's basically like an instagram post right right or a tiktok video it's just it's like you take the photo and you write a caption you know and it's but it's sort of i think it's such a cool like uh, it's just such a different way of interacting with that like if you think about okay what could i you're coming up with an Instagram post, you want to announce your engagement or you want to celebrate your kid turning five or whatever it is that's happening. And the way you think about an Instagram post is like exactly how I would think about a photo. Card. Right. Right. And, and you, you cannot photo. And then you're like, Oh, and then maybe that's the first photo. And then there's two other ones, you know, like you swipe through and there's two other ones. Those go on the back of the card. What do you want to say? And like, you know, like you come up with some cute emoji that you slap on there and like that's the design that you pick up. I just thought like, you know what, this could be such a cool trend. Like I would so much rather get that in the mail from my friend of like, right. Joey turned five that, you know, then like, no one's named Joey anymore. It's Declan. Their name, Declan, there were, these names did not exist. When Blue, I, was I had a couple clients with daughters named Blue. Like the color blue. Like the no, color I blue. like it. Blue's my favorite color, but it was like I didn't have that growing up. Not um, at all. I mean, I can assume if there's like four blues in your class, like the blue's not gonna get teased in my day. They would have, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, that's true. That's different true. times. Different um, times. Um but, but, but I yeah, love so that approach. I love that approach. Like Okay, don't think of it as a photo card. Think of it as an Instagram post that you just print and save and send to your friends and that you will have forever. I, you know, like, cause it's like you, you post that and it's fun and it, it takes, I mean, honestly, it takes a lot of time. You might as well be making a greeting card, right, you know, right. like it takes time to think about like which photos do all the, you know, enhancements that you're going to do, figure out what you want to say. It's like you could design a card in that same amount of time. And if I, if my friend sent me a card that was like, you know, their child's birthday. I, I would absolutely love that. It would feel like such a more special connection right, than right. like, I just saw that on my feed and like scrolled on to the next thing. You know, it's just, that's just how our attention span right. works. Right. Plus grandma is not on Instagram. And if she's, anything, well, she is, but it's very confusing for her. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. It's not the same experience as like just getting to hold that beautiful card in your hand and enjoy your grandchild's face. Right. Right, right. Yeah. And also grandma wants to put it on the refrigerator and she hasn't, she right. can't print it out from Instagram. Don't ask right. her to do that. <laughs> no, I mean, I, no, printers are the least intuitive devices. I don't think like 30 year olds can work printers these days. Um, but yeah, so I, I think, love um, I like, love that. yeah, I think basically like any time that you're, any time that you're thinking about an Instagram post, that's like a thing like, oh, could this, you know, should I send this as a card? You know, it's just like something to ask yourself. And maybe it isn't, but like maybe, you know, just mix it up. It's like, it could be a fun, um, just more personal connection. I mean, like I love getting a letter in the mail. Like yeah. there's just, it's just such a different, like I don't have my phone. I don't have distractions. Like I sit on the couch and I open it. Right, it's just right. a different and you can hold it like you can touch it and you can, you can look at the person's handwriting on it. You know, it's just completely different. Um, human experience yes. and i think that's what's been so like you know we're we see each other over zoom you yeah. know like to have something that that person touched and now i'm touching is really kind of special right now absolutely and it's um it's a little gift it's like look i'm sending this to you i'm putting this out there i'm giving it to you i don't want any i mean if you want to text me or call me i don't need it but i you don't need to i'm just putting right. it out there and it's this right. little experience for you in this little moment use it how you will. And, um, I just yeah, want I you to have cute. it. So 
it I helps those it. moment, like you described earlier, you, it, the process of doing that for yourself, it helps that whatever you're trying to convey in that card land for you. And then you tuck that in your memory box and you have that forever. You know, like I think any card project that you take on, like has that significance, like you, you have, you think a lot about what you're trying to say, like what you're trying to share. And I think that it, it helps you process your own life moments when you take the time to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And make sense of stuff. Yeah. And like you yeah. said, a lot of times you look at the picture later and you take something completely different from it, which is also really cool. Right. And, uh, no one's figured out how to have these experiences digitally. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, with our phones yet, you don't really have that. So, yeah. you know, there's something really magical and eternal um, about this. Well, listen, I cannot thank you enough for coming by and um, sh sharing this glimpse into your world. It's it's really, I don't think I'm going to look at photo cards the same way. And I look at them all the time. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah, for coming by the paper fold. And thank you so much for listening. As always, email me at sarah at thepapernerd.com with anything I can do for you. And if you're liking what you're hearing, please subscribe and leave me a good rating and review. I can't tell you how much that helps. Thank you so much, paper peeps. Please stay well.